Good afternoon and welcome to Wired's live living room sessions. If you've missed any or all of our sessions to date, we encourage you to go to Wired's YouTube channel, click subscribe and start viewing them. We are now in our 19th session and we have had a very interesting lineup of professionals. I can assure you that you will enjoy these sessions very much. On Thursday, I spoke with Dr. Charleston Bradford, the man leading the government of Barbados's weed planting initiative. We talked everything trees and how and why Barbados is planting one million of them. If you missed it, remember, click, subscribe, watch. If you're joining us for the first time, my name is Keisha Farnham and I am from Walker's Institute for Regenerative Research, Education and Design. And we are pleased to bring you this series in collaboration with our education partners, the Caribbean Permaculture Research Institute, CPRI, and powered by the Inter-American Development Bank. We will be continuing for the month of June to explore the topics of regenerative agriculture, climate change, building biodiversity, and renewable energy. We'll be doing this every Thursday and Tuesday at 1 p.m. Today, we're talking about a very exciting and novel project, the Barbados Trailway. To take us through this journey of discovery, we have with us social entrepreneur Barney Gibbs. Many of you may know Barney as the owner of Adopt a Stock Caribbean, a company that installs and maintains solar bus shelters in Barbados, St. Martin, and St. Kitts and Nevis. But as board member of the Future Center Trust and the project lead for Future Trees and the Trees That Feed Foundation, Barney Gibbs has planted 1,000 on mature palms along the ABC Highway with the government of Barbados and has been recently involved in a number of fruit tree planting initiatives. As the newly appointed chairman of the Future Center Trust, he is moving ahead with the Rail to Trail project to mark the Future Center Trust's 25th anniversary and to commemorate its founder, pioneer environmentalist Colin Hudson. Barney has been using his master's in land economy from Cambridge University to implement green transport, transport solutions in the Caribbean and is now applying them to the Barbados Trailway Project, an exciting multi-use cycle trail conversion of the historic old train line from Valley Buckley St. George to Cutset Bay St. John. This is exactly the type of project that we want to talk about on this show because it aims to provide healthy, a healthy means of transport and recreation for Barbadians and its visitors, and it has amazing implications for climate change, food security, and creating economic benefit for the nearby communities. Bonnie, it is indeed a pleasure to have you with us today. Hey, Keisha, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Yes, definitely. Well, Bonnie, um, as I, I was saying to you earlier, I, I know for many persons, they're, they're just hearing of this concept for the first time. They're just hearing about this amazing project that you have underway. Um, I know many people know you for the palms that are planted along the highway. They know you for Dr. Sub. They know your association with the Future Center Trust. But in this new role as chairman um, of the Future Center Trust, and with this amazing, exciting project, um, I can't wait. I can't wait to hear what's happening with this project. So I think the best place to start is always at the beginning, particularly when it's something new. Um, and so let's just start with the most basic of questions. What is this Barbados Trailway project? And where is it located? Okay, thanks. I, I thought you did a very good synopsis of, of the project during your, your intro there. Uh, as you mentioned, it's the 25th anniversary of the Future Center Trust. And we were we were looking for a sort of a, a marque project that would would mark the the you know kind of that sort of auspicious date for us, and the fact that Colin Hudson, who founded the trust, um, was a very big fan of the old train line, and in fact he he led many hikes along the train line and these sort of stop and stairs where they would um, they would use them as educational opportunities. So we were that is I guess initially what had us. Uh, examining the old train line, and we were noticing in the background this movement overseas for um, to utilize these this sort of industrial infrastructure that was just being, you know, marginal or or, or one side. And 
we're very lucky in Barbados. There are not there are not that many islands in the Caribbean that number one have a, have a, a, a train line, right. and, and even if in, even where they do, very often they don't have the kind of terrain that we do that makes it so conducive for a project like this. Um, so we came up with this idea of the Barbados Trailway, which is essentially a rail to trail project. That's the the term they use in the industry for these conversions. And as you mentioned, um, you know, what, what it involves is a 17 kilometer stretch in the first instance that is that basically runs from Valley in St. George, which is not far from Norman Isles around the boat for people who are using the ABC highway. It's just about maybe four or 500 meters to the east of that. And the reason we chose that as a starting point is that's where the, the trail runs kind of closest to highway five to the road. And, People can see what's going on and have some visibility. And we are looking to go as far as Concept Bay, which is about 16 or 17 kilometers, equivalent of 10 miles. Right. Because I always show that a 10 mile ride is a, a kind of a nice um, intermediate or, or even novice level ride. People who want to go further can go there and back. And, and indeed, this even this first stretch is just part of a much wider vision for an entire network of trails all over the island. Um, right. Some people might, might might be aware that there was a recent revision to the physical development plan, the um, Barbados, the PDP, as I said. Mm -hmm. We were able to get kind of encoded in this uh, PDP an entire, or, or the, the possibility of an entire future um, network of al an alternative transport network that utilizes not just bicycles, because it's a multi-purpose trail. So we're trying to encourage runners, joggers, um, cyclists, maybe even e-bikes for people that want, uh, you know, that are maybe new to the sport or, or have challenges. So what we're looking at here is a really a, a, an avenue for alternative healthy transport that is I would say, aimed primarily at locals, people living here, but that will, as an added benefit, create a free attraction for our visitors as well. Yeah. So in terms of... It, it sounds quite expensive when I know you said 10 kilometers, a novice could do it. <laughs> so I trust you. <laughs> yes. I haven't been bike riding in a very, very long time. I mean, I used to do it so much when I was younger. So this this is probably incentive, right? For me to get for me to get going. And I do know that um for those who are part of the cycling community, having a safe space to be able to do that is is always of major concern. Um so I think they in particular would also be incredibly excited about that. Um, when you were talking about, um, when I was uh, looking at the, the press release that you sent me, one of the things that was mentioned was that it could also be um, used in future for prisons to find their way to work. Um, and that's, that's quite interesting. Do you want to elaborate, elaborate on that a bit? Absolutely. Well, um, the trail, I guess, in the first instance was conceptualized as a recreational space because I think during the COVID lockdown as well, it, it added a certain level of, of urgency because we could sense that there was really an appetite, you know, while people were shut up, shut up in their houses and, and the, you know, children climbing the walls and, and there was an appetite for outdoor recreational space. Yeah. Um, I think that was demonstrated as well by the, uh, the South Coast Boardwalk, which was kind of an afterthought, but you can see that it's been embraced by, by locals and visitors as well. Yes. Um, whereas the bike trail now is almost like, it's, it's scaling that up. It becomes a rural South Coast Boardwalk that is 17 kilometers long, that has this added dimension, I guess, or this added um, possibility for, for actual commuter riding. Because it's not, it's not outside the bounds of possibility that someone let's say living in vineyard in st philip or maybe uh, working at sky mall yeah they could, they could ride without encountering any traffic along a smooth asphalt surface and be at work in about 15 20 minutes yeah. you know? and if you if you take it even further maybe someone living uh sorry uh, working in bridgetown they could ride from union and st philip come along the bike trail 15 15 20 minutes and maybe there's a city circle or some kind of shuttle transport that is touching Sky Mall and transporting people then to Bridgetown or to Warrens. Yeah. So you see where it could be an opportunity to commute in a, and, and get your, your daily exercise while getting to work. You're, you're reducing emissions, you're helping with global warming, you're, you don't need to go in the gym, and you've just got to work in half the time as sitting in traffic. Exactly. So that's a possibility. And, and I would add also to that that. You know, if we look 
overseas at the places where um, we have these have built up these bicycle networks there's a, there's there's very often the opportunity for children to ride not just for fun but to ride to school in groups yeah. mm-hmm. you know at a certain age if, if we can make it that safe uh, you know, I, I rode to school at, at Harrison College I think I was probably one of the last people that rode to school because there was a massive bi- bicycle room and there were about two or three bicycles myself and my, my good friend Ian Thompson really last we were some of the last people right in there and eventually they, they, they converted it to storage and, and so on yeah. so and if we go back a generation behind that uh, my grandfather and I think many of our grandfathers rode to work you know they, they lived outside of Bridgetown and maybe you know he was a clerk in Bridgetown and he would ride to work and back every day. So it's not as though a commuter bicycle culture is foreign to Barbados at all. If you go back a generation or more, a lot of our um, our poor, poor parents were, were on bikes. Yeah. I and think were, you know, were, were in good shape too. <laughs> exactly. I think one of the things um, you know having traveled to countries like the Netherlands and stuff where there's a huge bike culture, you know, but the bike culture is even bigger than the cars and you know people are using trains and that kind of stuff. But there's there's such a huge bike culture with all of its own norms and rules and stuff so much so that I when they listed rules that were required for you know to make sure that everybody's doing it properly you realize that there's really a whole infrastructure created around this and it has created a, a beautiful um, culture within that society of people getting more exercise people getting to work with, but also reducing emissions and we know that the goal, the goal of the government of what we is, is to become a new children in 2030 and something like this could definitely have a significant impact on us meeting that target if we have more people riding or more people get you know going to get to work that way and less cars on the road. I mean for a small island Barbados already has a lot of cars and you see it on the morning when you're going to work, right? So it has so many I mean just not only for just personal, you know, but just as a as a goal as a country, um, and in reducing our carbon footprint as a country, it has so many great implications. Um Bonnie, you know this this sounds amazing. Um, but you know the question always comes up: Who are we going to pay for it? Right? It sounds amazing. It sounds like you know expansive. There's definitely a lot of marketing in terms of getting people to make that cultural shift. That's going to be you know needed around something like this too, along with the physical infrastructure. So how is the trailway going to be financed? Yes. Well, that is always the the big question. Um, I think when we speak about financing this trailway, we can break it down into sort of two, two, two phases or categories. You know, there's the capital cost and then there'll be the operational cost to sort of maintaining the trail after it's built out. And um, the actual second part, the operational cost, the maintenance cost, we've gone quite fairly far in terms of getting commitments from the corporate sector, individuals, even people in the, the diaspora who are very interested in this project and who would um would be willing to to let's say cover the small ticket items uh, yeah. uh the benches the the landscaping um the interpretive signage a lot of that and and, and indeed the the maintenance so it's not just a in an eight or ten foot asphalt strip for the bikes we also want to have an an, an, uh, an eight foot grass verge either side yeah that workers and walkers come right on that would need to be cut and so we we do have um in mind companies who would pay uh, for that cutting once or twice a month. The big problem is the upfront capital cost because 80 to 85% of the cost of this project mm-hmm. is paving of it. Now, just to give us some perspective, in most of these projects where they try to do these um, real the trail conversion, all of these costs I just mentioned are insignificant compared to one massive cost, and that is the cost of acquisition of land. Um, During all of this, the government already owns the bike trail. This is the beautiful thing about this project. When, it, when the, the, the bike trail, when the sorry, when, when the train line went over business in 1938, the land eventually reverted to the state. So the entire entire length of this trail, the part that we're looking at now, is either owned or at least controlled by government. <clears throat> and so that removes about 60 to 70% of the usual cost of a bike trail project, leaving us a still significant cost of paving it. So the paving now, we were seeking ways to try to reduce that. 
And I have to give a shout out to the Ministry of International Transport and um, and Tourism, because what we realize is that at this very moment, they are doing a project where they're removing the top surface of the runway. Yes. They're, they're, yes. Yeah, so as they mill, mill this top surface of the runway off, um, there's a possibility for us to recycle some of that material into the bike trail. This is not normally uh, done on a road that would have 18 wheeler trucks and, and running on it, but for a, what they call a low load application, like a bike trail, it's yeah, possible yeah. to take some of this recycled, this um, granulated asphalt and cook it back in to the barber green as you pave. And so the next shout out is for CO Williams uh, uh, construction, because they have also offered to do this first demo phase. The demo phase being a one or one to two kilometer I would say proof of concept from Valley to Buckley that we want to really showcase exactly how the, the paving would look, how the landscaping would look, how the grass verges, the benches, everything. So that we can use that as a platform then to try to attract sponsors or donors for the rest of the of the length of it. And right. through those two those two uh, strategies, having a, a partner who's willing to do the work at a concessionary rate and having the land basically owned by government and then additionally them helping in the sense of, of giving us some recycled materials and the recycled aspect of it really appeals to us you know if you spend trust we promote recycling so it's yeah. consistent with the theme um that i think that has been able we've been able to bring the overall cost of the 17 kilometers down from the nine million barbados dollars quoted in the paper to about 6.9 barbados dollars so you're talking three and a half million us for a national bike trail project 17 kilometers long. I mean, there are houses in San Jose that, that cost three times that much, you know? Yeah. So I, I say all that to say that this, even though the numbers may seem big, this is an extremely cost-effective project because of some very unique circumstances that exist here. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm listening to you and um, I've said on the show before that, you know, we use the term stacking functions a lot. Um, a favorite term of our chairman. And if this is not stacking functions, I don't know what is. <laughs> this is no, it, it's it's amazing um, because you know if if you if just to break it down, you know if if you think about how much it would have cost you to, to bring in asphalt to just do the trails alone, if you weren't recycling something that was already in use. Um, but not only that, you I'm seeing a very clear public-private partnership definitely coming up here, you know, with the support of the, the government and with the support of private sector. Um, and, and that is the kind of relationships that we've talked about constantly on this show that are necessary for catalyzing change, right? There's, there's no way that one institution can do it on its own. Um, and, yeah. and I mean, we all know that, you know, as, as small island developing states, um, Barbados and other islands included, the resources are quite limited. So you have to find ways where things that are already existing, um, how can you reuse, repurpose, recycle, right? But also how you can work together in partnerships um, to get the job done. Um, and so it really is quite fantastic. It's a, it's a really good model. And I mean, I, I just did some cursory research on, um, on Google to see if there was any similar project in the University of Caribbean. And I, don't, I didn't see anything that looked quite like what we're talking about right here. So this could also be a really good uh, best practice as we continue throughout this, as to how a project of this magnitude could be undertaken by a country that has limited resources, led by an NGO, you know, bringing together government, bringing together private sector. I mean, it sounds amazing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, I agree with everything that you're saying, and and, and I, I think that to even step it, take it a step further, if we can sort of spread the love, as you said, and get as many many stakeholders involved in this project, or yeah. benefiting from the project, it's going to be even that much more durable and, and resilient. Um, I mean, you know, when I, when I say that, I'm not talking about the, the the entities that are directly contributing through sponsorship or, or a donation for asphalt but but just the, the the entities that would um experience a kind of halo effect near the trail so so if you have a rum shop that is within a stone's throw of the bike trail of the train line or if you have a, a snackette you can imagine that the increased footfall would be a great boost to the, a lot of these rural businesses 
yeah. which are very often, I think, a bit neglected as we focus on the coast road and uh, tourists and that type of thing. This entire rural corridor would, would benefit from this. You're, you're basically putting footfall right through some of the quietest agricultural areas in Barbados. Yeah. And, and then, it's quite then, beautiful too as well. I mean, when I first moved to this island, um, I wasn't sure how long I was going to be in. It was just kind of my goal to see everything. And so on the weekend, I would just drive. And the interior of Barbados is so stunningly beautiful. Um, so I can imagine doing that on bike. And I think even Barbadians will have an opportunity to rediscover their own home um, through something like this. Yes, I mean, it, it's really stunning. and. Uh, particularly right now, after that first rain, when it's starting to, to green up a little bit and the canes are down. I mean, when you ride on that trail, and, and it can be ridden on right now, you know, with yeah. the way, we want to make it more accessible, at least this stretch. You stretch, you stretch beyond Concept Bay, which goes up the East Coast, but always, we want, we'd always want to keep that as a mountain bike park where it's a bit more rustic and natural. But this part yeah. that we're looking to pave is, is, really, is really very beautiful. It's very undulating. It's in George's Valley. And so, yeah, I mean, well, the, the other thing, I, b b before I forget, when we're talking about getting people involved, is that we, we may also be able to offer, as part of this project, um, some kind of bike rental concessions or vending concessions. You know? So there may also mm -hmm. be sort of um, economic opportunities for small business people around this, uh, this, this, this particular project. So, yeah, there's going to be direct financing of it. There's going to be a halo effect for these, these surrounding areas. And then there will be sort of small business opportunities as well. Yeah. So we've talked about we've talked about all of these things. We've talked about a lot of good stuff. Um, but, you know, a project of this magnitude, there must be some challenges. Um, mm. And so if you had to identify what are the problems and challenges um, that you anticipate you know that you really come to once the railway is up and the trail is up and running. Yeah, I mean, any any time you 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 are dealing with a, a project of this magnitude and and high levels of public use, which we we hope and anticipate that we will get, you always have to confront the the, the issues of safety and personal security. Safety, mm -hmm. in its, I, I would start by saying. Uh, from from traffic, you know, safety as in um, avoidance of collision with vehicles, and that is more of an engineering fix. That that a lot of that can be mitigated through design. Um, where we are going to be, we have been consulting with engineer from the very beginning. Abdul, uh, sorry, David Pandora has been extremely helpful. He's an avid hike, hike, hiker, and he has been very helpful in terms of. Um, the design of the the grading of the road and the drainage and all of that, but also um, just researching overseas the kind of strategies that are used to keep people safe on the trail as they encounter the crossings. Because there are, I think, five or six crossings in the entire 17 kilometers, which is not considered, which is considered very few by international standards. So that's a yeah. that's a plus. But there are still crossings. I mean. There's one by by there's a constant crossing. There's one by Carmichael. There's by Windsor, I think by Carrington and by Three Houses. So, so what we mean by that is you know you you the the, the bike trail does encounter transept cross the main road at those points. So right. what what what, an, what a designer, landscape architect or, or engineer will, will come up with is this is an example. There are, there are many different ways, but the, that eight foot tarmac strip can split into what I call a snake tongue, right? So it, it splits into two four foot or two five foot strips with a low, a low um, landscaped island in the middle just before the, the, the crossing. So that alerts the rider that something is coming, something is happening, and it causes them to split like that. It also, by the way, stops cars from entering the bike trail. So that's a, an added traffic cooling measure, or traffic calming measure, as they say. Yeah. Uh, because you know, if you put bollards or something like that, the minute that an emergency vehicle has to come in, they don't have the key for the bollards, and yeah, 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 right. So a nice low tech solution is to have this this snake tongue, this low this low island, which and with some maybe shrubs in it, that the ambulance can drive over if there's an emergency, no problem. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it is known it is known to keep out ninety five percent of the most whatless uh, <laughs> persons from coming. <laughs> Sure. Okay. <laughs> as, 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 you, as you 
make this snake telling you are crossing over the main road to get to the other side. There's usually a sort of a raised crossing, sort of a, a 10 or 12 foot low flat, usually paved with cobblestones or some different surface that alerts to that, alerts the drivers, so that the drivers now coming down from the main road have to slow down when they encounter the, the crooked bike trail cross. And then there would be signage as well that 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 uh, brings you know brings that to the motorist. So that's just one example of the different traffic cooling measures, but calming measures, sorry. But also, you know, there would have to be, I believe, um, lighting and surveillance cameras because surveillance cameras will also pick up the kind of unauthorized, if there's any unauthorized use of the trail. Um, that's another sort of engine, you know, design fix. But also, we shouldn't, we shouldn't um, sort of discount this. What they've found when we talk to our counterparts in other countries is that there's a certain social deterrent that happens mm -hmm. enough, uh, 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 enough people using the trail, enough legitimate users on the trail, they kind of crowd out the unauthorized use because, you know, in Beijing parlance, they, they, would, they would tell you where to go, you know, they would, they would, they would, people will call out unauthorized yes. trail. And that's, that's yeah. a very important part. So, the safety in numbers, right? Safety, safety. Okay. safety is another another aspect you know we were just talking about safety from cars but um you know barbados is a beautiful place to live we all love living here but it's not it's not utopia it's not xanadu it's not shangri-la it's this is a real country and we do have we do have to be mindful of personal security particularly particularly since we're trying to let's say close a bit of a perceived gender gap when it comes to bicycle use in barbados and indeed the caribbean we want we want to achieve those sort of that sort of equality that you get in other countries in terms of the demographics of the use of the bikes. In other words, we want men, women, boys, girls using everybody bikes. to feel comfortable using it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the biggest deterrents to that will be any perceived threat to personal safety. So again, there, there, there are strategies, you know, the, the obvious, like lighting at key areas, um, surveillance cameras. What they do in other places is they, they they identify frequent users and they kind of deputize them to uh, become, I guess, like a trail monitor who has the yeah. report. They have a direct line of communication with police. There's also usually some kind of police presence either on sideway or on bicycle on the trail. So kind of following the South Coast Boardwalk playbook, um, the protocol there yeah. um, as a way of of, of mitigating any any security um, issues, and, and as well, it has to be said that while while the, the the entity that's executing this trail definitely has a duty of care to the public to make it as safe as possible, um, the users there is a certain also a certain level of um, responsibility on the part of the users or yeah. that is demanded of users as well to to for example avoid riding after daylight hours. Uh, to, mm -hmm. uh, I was actually just going to ask you that if, if you see it as only something um, that would be a daytime use, um, or if you, you, you see people probably using it not late, late into the night, but still using it after dark, um, and if lighting and stuff would be a consideration, possibly not in the initial stages, but later on. Yes, L lighting is a huge expense, but we'd have budgeted for lighting in key, in, in key areas. But mm -hmm. the that the entire trail is not going to be lit from end to end like a like a stadium or or, or um, a basketball court. Yeah. Then I would say it, it makes sense to at least put up signage advising people not to, to 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 you know to advising people to confine themselves to daylight hours and to ride um, in groups or with a, a ride with a buddy. Group. Yeah, I think as um, as something that is not necessarily as you said, you know, older generations have done it. Um, commuting on bike and you see a lot of people still doing it today but I think there's going to you're going to need to have a, a very comprehensive education program um, of just you know the do's and the don'ts you know getting just kind of having it running on loop as as, as the trailway is under construction so you kind of get people conditioned before it actually opens into so this is the proper use you know this is what you know, if you use it like this, it's not only for your benefit, it's for everybody's benefit, it's for your safety. This is what you should do, this is what you shouldn't do. Um, and, and have that come across in, in a way that really speaks to the to the Barbadian public. I think, um, that's a good idea. I think we should use this this lead time and, and you know, we don't know exactly how, how quickly this is this we can pull this off. So there there may be a, a, a 
you know, are comfortable in the time, we should yeah. use to try to shape expectations, as you said, and shape behaviors and try to get people in the right frame of mind uh, so that when it comes about, they they can write safely. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you're just joining us and speaking to the audience for the first time um, today, we are speaking to Bonnie Gibbs, uh, social entrepreneur and newly appointed chairman of the uh, Future Center Trust. Bonnie is the project lead on the Barbados Trailway Project. It is an exciting multi-use cycle trail um, that is the conversion of the historic old train line. Um, and so we were just discussing some of the challenges that Bonnie anticipates um, that, can, that we might encounter as um, people start using the trail. Um, I know earlier you had met, started to mention opportunities, um, but what other opportunities do you think the trailway will create beyond the recreational value? If you could expand on that. Yeah, there's so so many. I mean, we mentioned all of the sort of more direct benefits, like the the um, opportunities for bike rental concessions and this type of thing. But you know, if if we when I was when we when I was speaking about the lighting earlier, I was I was thinking about how how much of an opportunity there was even in in that one narrow aspect of the trail to showcase, for example, you know, the importance of using photovoltaic uh, energy to power the light. Yeah, and, and not just the lighting, but but anything to do with the trip, because our, our 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 goal is to make this whole project, this whole undertaking, carbon carbon neutral or even carbon negative, if if, if we can. We should have all the lighting as photovoltaic. We should have any um, maintenance vehicles, if possible, the the um, you know e vehicles. Yeah. We should, uh, um, any of these shade shelters, because it, we, we because we want to encourage commuter cycling, we're going to have some sort of shade shelters periodically where if it rains, people can duck under, and we can put photovoltaic lighting on those roofs. We can actually even do some water harvesting on those roofs where the, the, the rain collected off the roof is cast to the landscaping in the immediate area. Mm -hmm. and, so and so there's an opportunity to showcase um, a more sustainable way of building and of living Yes, that's, that's one. And then, and this is my favorite part. I have to say, there's a, a whole tree planting, um, food security, import substitution layer or dimension to this trail. I think it could be absolutely phenomenal. And that is, as you alluded to in your intro, the idea that we want we want to line this whole trail with thousands, literally thousands of fruit trees. Yeah, and other shade trees, but mainly fruit trees and. And, and and this is 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 an opportunity on many levels because it it provides I suppose in the first instance a way of, of providing material or 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 um, maybe say root stock for other people to take these plants and yes they can eat them they can blend them but they could also because we're looking to plant improved varieties right mm -hmm. over the last few years we've been going up every year to the mango festival. Yeah, there is a mango. Mango is my name. <laughs> international Mango Festival. So, uh -huh. Yeah, and you get to eat lots of mangoes. And it was in, it's in, of course, this year, sadly, it didn't happen right, because of the COVID, but it's an annual event. It's held at the Fairchild Tropical Garden. And our regional partner, a, a group called Trees That Feed, mm -hmm. have been very, very kind in, in helping us to get up there. And the goal was every year, they judge the best 10 mango varieties from all over the world. So from Cuba, Haiti, Israel, you name it. And there's a judging panel. They choose these 10 mangoes. And Teresa Fitz said, does, look, if you, if you get the uh, um, budwood from those 10 varieties and take them back to Barbados and graft them onto the local um, fruit trees, uh, mm -hmm. mango trees, by the time the project happens, you'll be able to, to plant the entire trail with these these improved mango breeds showcasing mangoes from all over the world. So now yeah, you see yeah. that there's an international fruit improvement dimension to it all, just in terms of what is planted. Then there's the way in which these, these trees are planted. We can plant them using very sustainable methods so that you can also showcase the, um, you know, the, 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 the means by which they're fertilized, the weed management around the trees and so on. Yes. yes. So, um, there's there's there, there's the, the sort of a, a procedural operational type of learning that can happen there and then beyond the sort of improved breeds there's also 
just those kind of trees that you don't see that much anymore because um, you know subdivisions are being built and, and these trees are, are wild trees are being a lot of them are being cut down so you know they're 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 they're, they're trees that are very hardy and drug tolerant and appropriate for a, a setting like that like dunks you know yes, yes. Are not, some of our young children don't even eat dunks they don't know what dunks are and i find that my boring because when we my friends would get on our chopper bikes and we would roam around and and, and, and we didn't even eat lunch did because we were so full of you know eating dunks and pastures and whatnot so I, I think it would be a really nice touch to be able to ride along the trail with your children and have all these different tropical fruits showcased. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there's that practical side of things where you're adding biomass, you're 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 reducing emissions, you're you're counteracting global warming. Yeah. And, and actually providing food for people. I mean, somebody is not part of our business plan or our revenue model to harvest these food. We're planting these cells in the fruit trees. These fruit tree, trees will be paid for by sponsors. They're going to be um, what you would call memorial trees or, or, yeah. or celebratory trees. You know, somebody's birthday, some people get married. So they, we're not really too bothered about, about, about actually collecting this fruit. So people can, yeah. can pick it. It's, a, it's what's called a free pick. Oh, all foraging time culture. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, that, so there's that whole 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 um, level as well. The, the the import substitution, food security part of the of the trip. Yeah, uh, I, I have one important question for you. How can I become a judge of this mango festival? <laughs> <laughs> this, sounds, this sounds like my dream job. This sounds like what I should be doing <laughs> with yeah. my life. <laughs> but you, know, if you need somebody to taste them when they get here. I'm putting up my hand for the job. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, if we can get the trail built like I, like I, like I want, and we can have this great diversity of mangoes, if you eat a mango at every stop along this trail, you'll become an international mango expert. And then you <laughs> Definitely. I think you've just added a whole layer of excitement to the mango lovers, for sure. Um, but, you know, so I'm hearing that the trail is going to be creation of livelihoods, right? So... We had mentioned earlier, you know, you, you have opportunities now for people who may have um, a small shop, rum shop, somebody who's selling food, um, et cetera, along the trail to be able to, to have pop-up businesses. So there's the creation of, of a new economy. Um, there's creation of food security and that foraging type, uh, which has worked very well in other parts of the world, um, foraging type community. Um, there's an opportunity for... Um, adding new varieties, but also conserving varieties that already exist, and also making the varieties that are already good even more tolerant to disease, et cetera, because you're bringing in, um, you know, varieties that are very hardy, right, to our environment, um, drug tolerance, et cetera. Um, and then we talked about um, reducing carbon emissions. Um, so we're looking at the reduction of carbon emissions that the trees will, of themselves will bring. Um, of people using the bikes more than using cars. Um, and all of this going towards the overall goal of Barbados for 2030, um, which is to reduce our, um, to our carbon emissions to net zero. So again, your project hits it on all of the different levels in terms of stacking functions. Um, and, and it really is a very, very exciting project. I know you mentioned that um, we started to talk about young people and parents being able to bring their kids to experience yeah. um, things that they may have lost along, I mean, with our generation, um, in terms of the younger generation. So what benefits do you see, particularly for young people of this trailway? Well, the youth and children have been at the center of, of our planning and our deliberation of this trail from the very beginning, because we really see them as benefiting most directly from this trail. You know, right. on, on an obvious level, there's the health benefits. I mean, we, we have to confront the fact that we do have a very high high rates of NCDs, non-communicable diseases uh, in this part of the world. Barbados is no exception. And in fact, particularly when it comes to children, we have to be very mindful of that. So on, on a sort of a health level, there's this very obvious benefit to the youth of using the trailway, just just being active and, and yeah, engaging yeah. in active transport. But 
the other sort of aspect of that that we consider extremely important is just the educational opportunities <clears throat> around this trail because in one way you can sort of see the barbados trail as this long linear outdoor classroom opportunity yeah mm -hmm. you know we're, because we, we all remember being able to go on a on a field trip and how much fun that was at school and and just getting out in the outdoors and that's that's where you can really learn about geography and, and history and the environment and, and agriculture and, and this creates an interactive opportunity where you know teachers could take out uh, groups and, and engage the trail one of our project partners um, two of our project partners which is Tara in Dr. Tara Innes from UWE and Kevin Farmer from the museum they've done quite a bit of research along the line and um, you know there's, there's some interesting stories that can be told through the trail. I mean, on obvious level, on obvious level, the trail, the original train line connected sugar factories and plantations. So there's that whole story of sugar that can be interpreted along the trail. But yeah. you may that the other how much, how, the other facets of it, like for, for example, at, at um, Three Houses, there was an Amerindian settlement at the spring there. And so they, they've been looking to do some pre-Columbian, some archaeology of the pre-Columbian artifacts there. So there's a whole story of, you know, Barbados before colonial settlement that can be told in that part of the trail and so on. Um, not to mention the, 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 the sort of environmental uh, aspects that we spoke about earlier. And, yeah. uh, and then because the trail runs through what is really, or could be the bread basket of Barbados, it's in George Valley. There's many, many points of contact with agriculture and farms yeah, yeah. going through there where, you know, the teaching of organic techniques um, and, and permaculture uh, principles could be could be showcased at certain plots along the way. <clears throat> so it's a, it's, a, it's a truly um, diverse learning experience, um, simply because this is a, a personal interest of mine from the anthropology point of view, you know, being able to understand all of our Caribbean islands um, from a time that was before uh, colonialism, I personally feel, and I know there are others who feel that way, um, gives us a very rich sense of history and a very rich sense of what we come from or where we come from as a Caribbean people. And that's, I think it's quite powerful as you delve down that road. So, I mean, that that too is an amazing element for young people to discover um, in terms of the history of Barbados or even any other Caribbean island. Um, in, in terms of, of the, the educational components of it, I feel too as well that if you get if you're able to reach young people now, they're going to be the leaders, you know, of, of, of tomorrow. They're gonna be where we are right now. And so if they are already in that space and they are already becoming familiar with a culture of biking to work and you know, being outside and, and the recreation and et cetera. It not only improves their health chances going forward and you know takes down the national overall national bill, so money that would have otherwise been spent spent in non-communicable diseases and managing that, you can now appropriate that to something else that could you know accelerate the nation's development. But they all you also learn better when you're healthier, yes, you know, as a young person too as well. So there's there's so many beautiful, far-reaching opportunities. I know we have a picture, there's a picture of the signs being put up. Um, so I'm asking the team to just put that picture up. Um, Bonnie, tell us, tell us what's happening here at this picture before we go into questions from the audience. Sure. Um, so this picture is taken at uh, Valley, which yeah. is the, at the Valley site. And it's showing on the left side, you're seeing the red line demarcates or, show, or illustrates the the whole 17 kilometers from from um, Valley to Concept Bay. And then mm -hmm. the blue section is the very first section that we want to do, what we call our demo stretch. And, um, you know, to use a cricket analogy, we would have loved to come out, you know, swipe in sixes, hit in sixes, and do the whole train line one time. But that is not to be because of the yeah. you know, circumstances. So if we can just punch some singles and, and rack up runs that way, then that's what we're going to do. And this, this blue section here will be that, that first, first swipe at it. Yeah. And then yeah. based on that, we can go for it. Yeah. 
And the other side is more an educational element, just letting people know what it is that you're doing, yes? Exactly. exactly. Is there anywhere that people can go to get more information or that you would be updating as things become more, um, as you start to roll out the project? Yes, the, the, um, the, there's a Facebook page for the, the Barbados Trailway that we're going to be using to update people. And, uh -huh, we're, and the, the, the Future Center Trust website, which is currently under construction because we're trying to uh, um, in, improve it to encompass the, the, uh, the, the Trailway project. Mm -hmm. That will also be a source of information as soon as it goes live, which should happen pretty soon. Uh, uh, okay. the kids are working on that for us. So Very there's nice. a space there. Excellent. So there's a space that person can get information as you go along. Uh, so if you're just joining us for the first time, we are speaking to Social Entrepreneur, a newly appointed chairman of the Future Centre Trust Body Gibbs about the Barbados Trailway Project, um, an exciting multi-use cycle trail um, that is the conversion of the historical train line. And I know that we have some questions from the audience, which is excellent. So uh, let's jump into those. Let's see what our first question from the audience is. And our first question is from a YouTube user. Um, so we're encouraging people to go to our YouTube channel, subscribe, subscribe, um, and start watching. What role do you hope private sector will play in the completion of the trailway? Is this a good model for public-private partnerships? So we touched on that a little bit. So Bonnie, if you could just elaborate. Sure, I, we did touch on it a little bit before when we were speaking about the, the two sort of aspects of it, the, the build out and then the maintenance. I yeah. think the build out, you know, is a big ticket item and we, we've been approaching some uh, philanthropic trusts and, and, and high net worth individuals and, and um, lending agencies for that bigger chunk. Um, but I believe that where you will start to see a lot more vibrant interaction with the corporate community here and opportunities for the sense of public-private partnership is in the um, in the more operational aspect of things. Yeah, so it's almost like a wedding list, you know, where people can choose according to their budget. So, from the very smallest company up to the biggest company, Barbies, you you know, you could sponsor one tree. Yeah, our, and that's why the Future Center Trust site is under construction because we're trying to build that that functionality and where where people could scale their their their, their contribution. So. It depends on how you define a public-private partnership. I mean, in a sense, the government is providing the, the, the land. It's, it's government land. It will remain as government land. It's, we're just being permitted to yeah. use it in this way uh, at their behest or kindness. Mm -hmm. So that's the aspect of things. And as we mentioned earlier, they're also donating um, some of the, the asphalt. But at various levels, from the smallest company to the largest company, there'll be opportunities for sponsoring a bench, sponsoring a tree, or sponsoring a shade shelter. There'll be opportunities for, for that type of interaction. It's to be encouraged so that people feel bought into the, to the project. Yeah. So to answer the question, is it a good model? I think absolutely, because even if you had the money in your back pocket to do it, it would not be, it is, it is preferable, I should say, to have that kind of broad-based involvement because this is a national project and we want people to feel involved. Yeah, and what you what you get is that buy-in and that vested interest also in terms of its its use and maintenance. So, yes. you know, when people feel like they have ownership of something, when people feel that something is important to them, then they take the, the steps necessary. And they're also looking at others to see what you're doing to make sure yeah. that you don't damage something that they have best, best That's in right. So it really then becomes a, a, a community um, project and you really get that type of buy-in. I know we have some more questions from the audience, so let's move into the next question. Yeah. This one is from Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. It says, would we want to stop shops opening along the trail to preserve nature? Is it better to allow it for economic gain? Is there a balance? Good question. Okay, I guess a, a good question. You know, we, we haven't planned for any type of build out of, of, of structures or, or shops along the trail per se, except maybe a trailhead shop at the very beginning or very end. Mm -hmm. Because I mentioned a little earlier, what we really want to do is to foster the halo effect that, that would improve opportunities for the shops that are already there. Because you have to remember, the, the trail the trailway runs right through areas where there are rum shops and snackettes. And, 
quite nearby, you know, a stone's throw, maybe 50 meters away. Yeah. Through the side road. And um, so we wouldn't really, we would want to encourage and, and, and improve opportunities for businesses that already exist more yeah. so than, than, than uh, opening opening up shops. Other than maybe a bike rental concession because something like that doesn't, doesn't exist already. So that's something that would need to be encouraged yeah. from scratch. And I would say that's something that's needed, um, particularly as people start to try it out, just people might want to make the investment of buying a bike right off the bat. But if there was some way that they could give it a try and see whether yeah. they like it, and then as they start to get more, you know, they're like, okay, yeah, you know what, I'm going to invest in a bike, I'm going to buy a bike. Um, and, sure. I, and I have to say- you should you know, have ride sharing programs now too that are not bike rental in the in the traditional sense. You know, they're where you, you, you just, touch your, 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 your smartphone and that enables you to ride one way and you jump off and that was 50 cents and then you come back and touch your smartphone and it's 50 cents back the other way. You know? So there's yeah. ride sharing as well that could happen. Good, yeah, so it really does open it up for anybody who's willing to try. I would say too that the local businesses that would be along that route, they, they're gonna be affordable too as well for locals, which is good. So you know, it doesn't, it, it fosters business for them, but it also comes at a price point that is nice and easy for the user. It's not tourist prices, basically, um, that you're probably be looking at, yeah? This, this bike trail is, has been conceptualized and designed primarily for locals in the first instance, with visitors invited as well. You know, it, too many of our, of our attractions, I think, are geared solely to visitors whereas what visitors oftentimes like and is in that interaction with locals they like the best attractions in Barbados are the ones where locals and tourists are kind of interacting on a level and oysters fish fry uh, the boardwalk and that is the kind of, 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 um, of spirit that we want for the for the bike trip yeah I, you know there seems sometimes there's always this um, concept that things need to be extremely polished and extremely Exactly, tourist oriented for people to be attracted to doing it and stuff like that. But um, keeping something uh, well done, so not saying that it shouldn't be well done, keeping it well done, but keeping it local is often a huge draw for tourists. Like they don't, they don't want something that's manufactured for them. We, we found that with, with exactly. culture, so, you know, we, we usually tell people that you know it's not it's not this culture but on your garden, and they're like, yeah, that's why we love it. <laughs> you know that kind of way. We want that natural, you know, that natural impact. We want that natural impact. So, so you're right in terms of, you know, having it for locals is is really something that's not again outside of the box when it comes to the way that we develop um, products, particularly within islands that are highly dependent on tourism. All right. Do we have any more questions from the audience? All right, so we have a question from Anneli. Hi, Anneli. Hi, Anneli. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Anneli's question is, given the beauty and rich historical references on that extended landscape, it would be a potent environment for artists to engage with. Bali, might this project be open to artistic interventions on the trail? Good uh, question. <laughs> yeah, it's very good. I like that. I like, I like the way you're thinking, Anneli. <laughs> we, we are... Well, not we as a future center trust, but in my other hat as um, adopt to stop the bus shelters and benches, we had a collaboration with Fresh Milk and Anna Lee. Fresh Milk is an artist collaborative, and it, I I really really enjoyed doing it. And what it was is we were basically putting uh, engaging with local artists and inviting them to display their art on a on a bus stop bench. Yeah. So. Um, Right away, I could think of uh, maybe not the exact same opportunity, or it could be the same opportunity, but all the way along this uh, trail, there's going to be opportunities for interpretive signage. You know, these sort of maps and books of explaining and, and how to in interpret the same um, rich historical context. But I think that there, there's a, there should also be uh, some kind of avenue for artistic expression as well. So, um, you know, I'm glad that that Annalie brought that up, and what 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 that actually raises is this bigger point of us wanting to sort of collaborate or in, or invite other stakeholders to the project, you know, with their ideas and and with the kind of of, of things that they want to to, to to display or reference on the trip. It yeah. just makes it feel more interesting, really. It really you know, does. It really does. When, and when I, it, Sorry, I, know, I think it's an important element of this whole trail is to 
make people feel yes comfortable in terms of they're not riding on a bumpy road but also comfortable in the space because we don't want people any longer to feel alienated from these areas right and if you think about st george valley and these sort of these big plantations and everything um maybe i'll just tell a little quick story to illustrate your point oh, go ahead you have time <laughs> Am I out of time? Yeah, no, no, you have time. You can tell right. a quick story. Yeah. About two years ago, I got a call after the uh, the, 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 the um, signs went up. And it was a gentleman who was calling me. He was saying, you know, during COVID, he started writing with his eight-year-old daughter. And and they've only been writing in sort of small circles in, the development, in their development. And then they saw these signs go up. And they got really excited about it because they wanted to know were they allowed to write through there. And, and it felt it was a little sad because they thought to myself, you know, that trail has been public land for so long, but somehow he felt it was a bit forbidding or, or, or he felt alienated from that space. He didn't feel comfortable riding through there with his little dog because, well, he said so. He said he wasn't sure, you know, if it was private, you know, but he pelting shots at him, he driving through there. And so yeah. it, made, it also made me realize that there's this another level where we need to make people feel invited to the space and feel ownership of the space. and. And I think that that the art that 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 Anna Lee is talking about can be a part of that, and the interpretive side as well. Just yeah. uh, it's, it's you know you mentioned regenerative agriculture. Well, I think the entire project could be regenerative in many different senses of the world, not of the word, not just yes. improving human health and improving soil health, but regenerating this enthusiasm for engaging the physical space. Yeah. Well, you know, the whole concept of regeneration is actually a very holistic and, and regeneration agriculture is, um, it, regenerative agriculture, sorry, is actually a very holistic way of looking at it. So you just don't look at the land and the soil and the plants, you're looking at the way that people interact with the land and the soil and the plants, you're looking at the way the economy interacts with it, you're looking at your intellectual capital, you're looking at your creative capital, your culture, there are a whole bunch of different elements that go into that whole concept of regeneration. So definitely a project like this can be considered a regenerative project um, because it, it takes into consideration so many elements, so many factors. Um, you know, one of the things that I've heard Chris and say to me here um, for the time that I've been here in Barbados is, you know, that's not for us. You know, I talk about something that I've done and they're like, that's not for us. And I'm yeah. like, but it's it's in your country. It is for you. So there is there is, and I'm not saying that's everybody, but there is a view by some Barbadians that you know certain things are not for them. So right. having this project come from a place where it is built for local culture, letting people know right from inception that mm -hmm. it is for you, this is yours. Um, and I think that that's a really beautiful, a really beautiful concept. I'm going to squeeze in one more question, Bonnie, because um, I know we have a couple. So let me squeeze in. This question is from Richard Archer. Hi, Richard. Hi, Richard. All right, it says, can you integrate historical photographs in large signage as a contextual, interactive, and educational dimension to the project? Excellent. Absolutely, question. absolutely, Richard. I, I, I think that the, the shade shelters that we spoke about earlier, which are meant to be located more or less where the train stops were historically, would be mm -hmm. a really good opportunity for mounting displays of photographs, uh, uh, you know, along different themes. Maybe each, each shelter could have a different educational theme and, um, and the, the shelter would allow them some protection from the weather and the elements from the sun to avoid fading. So, Yes, quick answer is absolutely, and I think that the large shade, shade structures would be the right one of the ideal places to do that. Yeah, well, I mean, this has been such a great conversation. Um, and if you do have the time, no pressure. If you want to go onto the Facebook feed after, or even the YouTube feed, and you can place some comments, or perhaps place the link to the Facebook page that you were referencing, where people can be, uh, get updated. You can do that after the fact. Um, for those of you who may have missed any part of what we're talking about today, um, please go to our YouTube channel for this recording. Um, you can reach out to Barney um, to ask more questions. Sorry, Barney, for putting you on the spot. Reach out to Barney. <laughs> we, want, we want other people at the table. Right? Yeah. Um, we're trying to get as many people as on board. Thank you so much, Barney. Um, this has been a real revelation for me and now I mean I, I had an idea but now I'm even more excited and I'm pretty sure that 
of those who have listened and are more excited and are going to be sharing this message with others too as well. I'm definitely wishing you all the best for this project. It is definitely a very worthy project. Um, so thank you so much for your time this morning, well, this evening. <laughs> Anytime. All right, great. Uh, so, you know, we just have this really exciting um, journey laid out for us by Bonnie. And I have to say, once again, thanks. Um, please, if you've missed any part of today's session, I repeat, please subscribe um, and make sure that you catch up on the Wired, Wired Living Room sessions. Later this week, uh, on Thursday the 18th at 1 p.m., CPRI's Jen Ward Clark speaks to Nia Talbot of Full Belly Farms in the British Virgin Islands as they explore the topic of hurricanes and climate change, lessons learned on a small island farm. I think this is going to be a really interesting topic, particularly as we enter into the hurricane season. Um, and it will really give you an idea of how permaculture could be used to mitigate some of the impacts of um, one of the more serious elements of climate change, which is the increase on swells of hurricanes. So join us later this week. Um, join Jen later this week. And thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>